So I want to talk a little bit about wind generation. Now I'm sure that some of the things I'm going to say people are going to hate actually. So I've got some stuff up here on the screen which is a search right now that I'm looking at and I'll be reading from that and I'll give you some idea what that is. But it seems to me from all the comments that I've got and the views that I've got that what people think is it's the machine. It's the machine that matters. And I hate to say this but it isn't. Well I mean it kind of is but mostly it isn't. If you think about what wind generation actually is, then it's the wind pushing or dragging a blade. That blade then rotates a generator and we get our energy out of it. But the energy is in the wind's push. Now, the amount of energy in a wind is fixed. It's fixed by the volume of air moving. A volume of air is clearly to do with wind speed and also to do with the blade length of the machine that you put in there, because that blade sweeps around. So the swept area is what's important. The bigger the blade, the more volume you're getting through. It's like adding more people who can push it. If you have a short handle, you can't get many people to push. Big old handle, lots of people, lots of push. Same thing, big old blades, you've got more volume. Faster the wind, you've got more volume, so the thing will generate. Now. According to Wikipedia, the average wind speed in the UK, which is where I live, is 8.2 knots, which is about 4.2 metres per second. That's the wind speed average for the last 20 years. Now, I'm looking at a machine here called a Tessop, a Tessop 940, uh, a Master 940 wind turbine, and it's advertised bold as brass, one kilowatt power generation, Master 940, 380 pounds. And that seems awesome. I mean, it's a kilowatt hour. Surely we should get that, and it's quite a reasonable price. But they also tell you what the blade size is, and the blade size is 0.8 of a metre. Now then, if I use an online calculator, and the on online calculator I'm using is Omni Calculator, and I put in that blade length with that wind speed, the available wind power is 91 watts. So for the last 20 years, on average, all that Tessup could do is generate 91 watts. And yet, bold as brass, in the advertising on the box, they're calling it a kilowatt hour wind turbine. Now, 91 watts is what energy there is in the wind at that speed with that area. You can't get any more, that's the available energy. So it can't even be what it says it's going to be, and yet, bold as brass, they say it is. It amazes me. Now, when the wind passes through something, you can't get all of the energy out. If you get all of the energy out, it acts like a wall. Once it's like a wall, no more energy, no more wind can flow, and you need flow. We have to have flow. If we don't have flow, we have no turning. If we have flow, we have turning, and you can see that in a water turbine pretty easily. It's the same with wind. The wind has got to flow. If it drops to zero at the other side of the turbine, it acts like a wall, and there's no flow, and then there's no generation. Now, this was actually discovered, in inverted commas, by a guy called Betts, and it's called the Betts Law, and it limits the amount of energy to 60%. Now, it's an interesting example, actually, of Stigler's Law. Stigler said that no invention, no discovery, was actually made by the person it's named after. So, for instance, we think of Newton's Laws. Now, actually, Newton's Laws were invented by Huygens, Hooke, and um, I think it was Galileo. Newton only came up with the third law. So it's really a, a funny thing that we, we don't name things properly, as it were. We just name them after the people we know rather than the people that invented it. Anyway, it's Betz's Law. It's 60% that you can get out. Now, the best turbines, those great big massive ones that you see sitting out at sea, uh, churning around, they're around about 80% efficient of the Betz limit, which means that at maximum, they're 48% efficient at getting that energy out of the wind. So, in England, the energy available in the one that I just described is 91 watts. We can get roughly half of that. So, the maximum efficiency, or the maximum amount of power that that four-sail turbine can generate is 50 watts. I mean, that's a long way away from a kilowatt, isn't it? So, 50 watts is what you can get out of that thing. Now, it doesn't really matter much what machine you put in front of something, remember. It's only got so much energy in the wind, you can only get 60% of that energy out. So you're not going to be able to get more out of a 4.2 meter second wind with the blade length of 0.8 than about 50 watts. That's all you're going to get from something like that. However, 
good your machine is, even if your machine is 100% efficient. And of course it won't be. So what does all that mean? Well, when we're looking at um, building machinery, and looking at doing something like this, we have to give it a context about how good it's going to be. So what is that context? Well, for me, it's actually cost. It's cost of generating. Now, you can make machines beautifully, beautifully efficient, but the more you approach the top end of that efficiency, the more disproportionately expensive they are because they require much better engineering. The better your engineering, the more expensive it is. So as we approach 100% efficiency, we approach ridiculous costs. Costs that nobody's going to incur. Okay, let's give that some now, numbers just to help see. Now, these are imaginary numbers. I'm plucking them from the air, but it illustrates what I'm on about. Let's say you build a 5-watt generator. Okay, nobody's going to do that, but let's say you do. And let's say that 5-watt generator costs you £50 to build. As it happens, the first £10 was spent generating 4 watts. That extra watt because of the costs of engineering, will cost you an extra £40 to get. Now, that's the kind of orders of magnitude you're looking about when you're trying to improve efficiency by improving the engineering. 80% of the cost sits at that top 20% of improvement. So it's a lot of money. It's easier just to buy two 4-watt generators at a tenner because they add up to 20 quid, instead of paying 50 quid because... 40 quid is spent on that extra watt. If you have a less efficient machine, it's going to be cheaper to make. And let's look at what Luke did. I mean, what Luke did cost us about two hours of his time and maybe, maybe five pounds in nuts and bolts and welding rods, something like that. So a fiver or less, because we were given the fan, remember. The soil pipe was reclaimed from something else. Even if you included the soil pipe, you're only looking at 10 pounds in total for that machine. So if that machine was one uh, 38th, if you like, so one 40th is efficient. So even if that machine produced one 40 of the 50 watts or so, so two watts, even if it did that, it's more cost efficient than buying that 380 quid machine. And that's the kind of thing I mean. Now, we measured it in a wind speed of 2.5 meters and it turned out to be more or less right. I mean, it was a little down, but more or less right. So in terms of cost, making those machines actually is far more efficient than it is in buying one. And that's what I mean about context. The context of wind generation has to be in cost. I mean, of course, you need more machines if you can have the same generation. So if we had two machines, we would generate more. We would have spent 20 quid and we'd have about 30% more than if we'd spend 380 pounds. Two machines means having two more things to look at, but these are the kind of balances that you need to look at rather than saying to yourself, oh yeah, but is it super efficient? Super efficiency actually costs a lot. And super efficient stuff is actually more prone to breaking down than stuff that isn't as efficient. It does tend to be more robust. So those, I think, are, to my mind anyway, are the kind of context you need to think about wind generation. There's a huge argument that goes on between people. I have absolutely no idea why. They talk about the difference between vertical and horizontal wind turbines, and really, it's a mystery to me. Uh, apparently, the vertical ones are supposed to be more efficient, and yeah, I suppose so, but let's face it, it can't be more than 48% efficient, can it? Because that's all you can get out of it. So it can't be any better than that. So that efficiency really is, I think, a bit like shaving the rind off cheese. It's going to give you tiny little slivers of stuff that really doesn't matter that much. That's why I don't really care, because to my mind it doesn't matter. There are other things that are more important, like where can you put it? I mean, here in England, we have to have planning permission to put up a vertical wind turbine. But a horizontal wind turbine, you can bolt it wherever you like and as many as you like and nobody's going to complain. Unless, I guess, you covered your entire house in them, they might get a bit upset. But if you put a couple of vertical wind turbines up on your roof and it looks a bit like a chimney, nobody's going to moan. You stick up a, uh, sorry, horizontal wind turbine. You stick up a vertical fan in your back garden, you need planning permission. So there's a whole host of other things to think about when it comes with um, these kind of things about what makes it a good wind turbine or not. But the chances are the efficiency of it, which is something that everybody seems to think is important, isn't actually that important. It's like I say, it's not the machine. It's the amount of wind that you can get through there, how fast that wind is going and what volume of wind. That's the real governor. The machine itself 
if it's efficient, you'll get more out for sure. But that more out is going to be a bit like cheese rinds and it's going to cost you an awful lot of money to be able to get that efficiency. And you have to ask yourself the question, well, is it worth it? I mean, we can bolt together some really simple, cheap, effective things made out of stuff like bicycle wheels, car fans, washing machines, all sorts of stuff where we're paying 10, 20, 100 pounds on the thing and we get actually pretty decent generation. I mean, that generation isn't going to be top-end engineering generation. Of course it isn't. But even if it's 70, 80% efficient, which is what it's likely to be, then it's going to beat the pants off of something that you can buy, mainly because you can make two. Making two means you're going to have that much more. And these are the kind of reasons I don't think it really matters about this huge argument between HAWTs and VAWTs. As far as I'm concerned, it's arguing whether you should buy half a dozen eggs or six eggs. To me, it makes no difference at all. It's arguing about nothing. Get what you like, get what fits your situation, and get what particular favourite you'll want. I mean, I know, that's heresy. But, to my mind, that's the way it is. It doesn't make that much difference, really. Okay, maybe you'll squeeze an extra erg out of it somewhere along the line. But, at the end of the day, it's all down to cost of production. Now, I was working it out, actually. Even if I'd bought that fan new, that fan would have cost me £50, £60. Pounds. So the whole build out of new equipment would have been about £70 as opposed to £380. Astonishing. Anyway, I wanted to talk about those things because, as I say, I found that people are, I, I think, focusing too much on the machine rather than what is, for me, the reality of the situation. That reality is there's so much energy in the wind and that's all you're going to get. There is a cost associated with generation and there are other factors to think about rather than just what is the most efficient machine. Anyway, I thought I would share that with you. I hope you enjoyed the video and thank you very much for watching.